Okay, so let us get started. Uh, so, last time uh, we were discussing the class N p and uh, we saw certain examples of problems that are there in N p. So, let us continue with our discussion. Uh, so, what we will see today is uh, this notion of completeness, okay. completeness of a complexity class. So, let us uh, Let us look at the class N p and uh, see what we mean by uh, N p completeness. Okay. So, intuitively N p complete languages or N p complete problems are those problems in N p that are uh, the hardest problems in N p. N p complete problems are in some sense uh, the hardest problems in N p. So, we need to define a notion of hardness. Okay. So, what do we mean by hardness? So, whenever we uh, talk about hardness or uh, uh, easiness, uh, we do so in relative terms. Okay. So, something is hard means it is hard with respect to some other stuff. Okay. So, we need to define a notion of uh, relativity here and uh, so that comes from uh, the notion of reductions. So, let us look at reductions and uh, formally define them. So, we will see what are known as uh, polynomial time uh, carp reductions. Okay. So, the book uses this term uh, polynomial time car reductions to uh, denote these kind of reductions, but in other texts or in other places you might find things like polynomial time many one reduction and or, uh, or just polynomial time reductions and they typically mean the same thing. Okay. So, what are uh, these reductions? So, let okay. So, we say that a language L okay, L polynomial time carp reduces to a language uh, let us say L prime if there exist a uh, polynomial time computable function f. Okay. So, f uh, basically uh, takes strings and outputs string. Uh, okay. Just write it here. Table function f from 0 1 star to 0 1 star such that for all strings x, x is in L if and only if f of x is in L prime. Okay. 
So, basically f is mapping the yes instances of the language l to the yes instances of the language l prime and the no instances of language l to the no instances of language l prime. Yeah. Uh, it means that uh, there is a polynomial time Turing machine which given a string, okay, so let us say it is given the string x, it will output the string f of x uh, on its output tape. So, we uh, consider the following model. So, our Turing machine has these three tapes. So, it has an input tape okay, uh, and the input tape is read only. Okay. It has a all powerful work tape. Uh, which means that you can read as well as write onto this tape and then it has an output tape. And this is just write only. So, you cannot read uh, information of this tape. So, now there is a, so, so, so this is a polynomial uh, time machine. Uh, which when given the input x on its input tape, it will output f of x and then halt. So, now that we have the tool of reductions with us, let us define what uh, we mean by these uh, so called hard sets. So, first we will define uh, uh, this class known as n p hard. Okay. So, a language is said to be n p hard if for all languages L prime in N p, L prime uh, reduces to L. Okay. So, this is the notation that uh, we use for these kind of reductions. So, let me just mention it here. So, I will just write it here denoted as. So, here we were reducing L to L prime. So, that is denoted as L reduces to L prime and this subscript P means that it is a polynomial time reduction. Okay. So, we say that a language is N P hard if all other languages in n p or any language in n p reduces to l in polynomial time. And uh, we say that l is n p complete if L is n p hard and L belongs to n p. Okay. So, it is not necessary that all n p hard languages uh, will belong to n p. In fact, you can uh, very easily find uh, n p hard languages that are not in n p. I mean take some really hard language. Okay. Uh, may be an undecidable problem, an undecidable language. Of course, uh, every other language in NP will reduce to it, but uh, there is no algorithm. In particular, there is no NP algorithm for that problem. So, NP completeness uh, uh, in some sense 
characterizes the most hard languages in NP up to polynomial time reducibility. Okay. Any questions? So, let us look at some uh, easy to prove properties of uh, these concepts. Firstly, if L uh, polynomial time reduces to L prime and L prime poly in polynomial time reduces to let us say some language L double prime, then uh, L also reduces in polynomial time to the language L double prime. In other words, this operation the, uh, the polynomial time reduction operation is transitive. Okay. So, this is known as the transitivity property. So, why is this true? Yes? Yes, because if you take a polynomial and uh, look at its product with another polynomial, what you get is also a uh, polynomial. Let us look at another property. So, let uh, L be an N p complete problem. Then L is in P if and only if P is equal to NP. Okay. Again, this is easy to see because if you take any NP complete problem and if you assume that uh, that language is in P, then, huh? then all problems in NP will also reduce to uh, uh, that particular language and then by using that uh, the P algorithm for this language, you can show that all of NP is contained in P. Okay. This is again by the same idea and the other way uh, is also true. So, if P is equal to NP, it means that uh, all problems in NP lie in P, in particular the NP complete problems also lie within P. So, both directions are true. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. So, it depends how you are uh, looking at the reduction. So, if you just assume that uh, uh, you have access to many tapes, okay, then what you are saying is correct. You can just look at the sum because then what you do is that you have a machine which computes this reduction, let us say m. Uh, m 1 and you have another machine m 2 for this reduction. So, you construct a third machine m which just uh, takes the output of m 1, feeds it onto the input of m 2 and then just outputs the output of m 2, okay. but it is using one extra tape for that. Okay. But suppose you do not want to uh, make use of that extra tape, suppose you have only one work tape, okay. uh, you want to construct a third machine which only has one work tape. Then what you do is that for each bit uh, that is required by M 2, you go back to M 1 and you uh, do the entire computation of M 1, get what that bit is and then carry on with the computation of N 2. Okay. So, yeah, you are doing some extra work, but uh, just cutting off the use of an extra tape. So, you are right, yeah. So, what if we uh, assume L to be NP hard here, can we make the same statement? Can 
we still uh, have the same conclusion. Why not? Huh? Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So basically, we can conclude one of the directions, right? So if we assume L to be NP hard, then if L is in P, it would imply P is equal to NP. But the other way uh, need not necessarily be true. Okay. So if L is NP hard and P is equal to NP, it need not imply that uh, L will also belong to P because, as you said, it's a wider set. So let's. Uh, move on and uh, so what we will see next is uh, our first NP complete problem. In fact, we will construct the first NP complete problem. Okay. Because uh, so far, I mean, with all these theory, I mean, nowhere uh, are we saying that uh, there has to exist an NP-complete problem. I mean, it it might turn out that I mean, even proving existence or uh, constructing an NP-complete problem is not possible. So, what is the guarantee that there are problems which uh, have this property, or there are natural problems which have this property? So, we will uh, prove that this problem satisfiability is the first uh, as our first NP complete problem. And historically also uh, uh, when researchers were studying NP completeness and uh, they came up with the first NP complete problem, this is what they had shown. Okay. So, this was proved in early 70s. Uh, independently by two people, uh, Cook uh, in 71 and Levin in 73. Okay. So, Cook was in America and uh, Levin was in Russia. So, communication was not that good in that period. So, uh, they both basically came up with the same result, but uh, independently. They showed that SAT is NP complete. Okay. So, let us quickly see what the problem uh, SAT is. Okay. So, a Boolean formula. phi basically consists of what? Uh, it consists of some uh, variables and uh, uh, the operands and or and uh, not. A Boolean formula is basically a string of variables uh, together with the following operands, where the operands have the usual definition. Okay. So, suppose you have a Boolean formula on n variables. Okay. So, suppose uh, phi is a formula on n variables and uh, z is some n bit string then phi of z denotes the value 
of substituting the variables of phi with z okay in order i mean so basically you take the uh, first variable of phi uh, wherever it occurs and you replace it with the first bit of z and so on so whatever value that you get as a resultant is what uh, phi of z is. So, then when do we say that a formula is satisfiable? So, we say that a Boolean formula phi is uh, satisfiable if there exist uh, some string uh, ok. So, let us say we are looking at Boolean formulas over n variable. If there exist a string z such that phi of z evaluates to 1 or uh, sometimes we will refer this to also as it evaluates to true, okay. I mean the same thing. Otherwise, we say that phi is unsatisfiable and there is a special kind of uh, Boolean formulas that we would focus at for uh, the purpose of our uh, proving this theorem that is uh, formulas which are known as CNF formulas conjunctive normal form. So, phi is said to be uh, in C n f ok, which stands for conjunctive normal form. if phi is an and of ors of variables or their negations. So, this is what a CNF formula is and in, in fact uh, what we will prove is that uh, a Boolean formula which is in conjunctive normal form. Uh, so, basically satisfied uh, the language uh, SAT will consist of all Boolean formulas uh, in conjunctive normal form which are satisfiable. set of all formulas such that phi is a satisfiable Boolean formula in conjunctive normal form ok. So, we will see this uh, proof for the remaining part of our talk. So, the first thing that we need to uh, argue in order to show that uh, sat is n p complete is to show that sat is in n p ok and that is easy to see ok. So, how do we uh, prove that sat is in n p. 
Hmm? So, what would that certificate be? It will, yeah, it is just a string z corresponding to uh, uh, assignment of values to the variables of phi. Okay. And if phi is satisfiable, then we know that uh, such a certificate exists, which would uh, evaluate phi to true, otherwise not. Okay. So, sat is in n p. Okay. So, this is easy to see. The hard part is to show that it is n p hard. Okay. So, before uh, we go into the actual proof of that result, let me uh, state a uh, easier to prove claim. So, let us look at the following claim first. Suppose, we have a Boolean formula on uh, L variables. Okay. So, let F be a Boolean formula on L variables. Okay. Then, there exist a C N F uh, formula. Let me call this phi of f, just to denote that this formula will depend on this function, such that uh, it has two properties. Firstly, phi of f on any input uh, z is equal to f of z. And uh, secondly, this formula has size has size l times two to the power l. Okay, and by size, what uh, what we mean is the number of gates in the circuit. So, essentially what we are saying in this uh, claim is that, if you are given a Boolean function, okay, any arbitrary Boolean function from L variables uh, to 0 1, we can construct a corresponding C N F formula, okay, which will exactly uh, replicate that function in the sense that it will have the same value for all uh, strings of length L and it will have size uh, actually at most. Uh, let me just say this. It will have size at most L times 2 to the power L. Okay. How do we show this? Okay, I would not give the complete proof, but I uh, will give the essence of it. Uh, you can always fill in the details. So, uh, suppose if you look at a uh, string, okay, suppose if you look at some string of length L, so let uh, z be a string of length L, then uh, for z actually we can create a CNF, uh, not a CNF, but actually we can create a formula, which has the following structure. There exist a formula, let me call this uh, phi subscript z 
on uh, L variables, okay. uh, let us say from x 1 through x L such that phi z on z is equal to 0 and for any other y that is not equal to z, it is 1 for all y not equal to z. So, this is not difficult to see. So, any ideas how we can construct a formula like this? Exactly. So, let us just see this with a small example. So, suppose if you have a string. So, suppose z is the string 1, 1, 0, your corresponding phi z will be the, uh, the formula x 1 bar, because I have a 1 here odd with x 2 bar odd with x 3. So, the only string for which this uh, formula would evaluate to 0 is z and nothing else. Okay. So, now, uh, so, now that we can do this, uh, let us go ahead and uh, construct uh, the formula phi f. So, what would phi f look like? So, phi f would be the and of it will be and of all phi z's, uh, let us say over variables x 1 through x l such that, which uh, z's do we consider? No. So, we, so we look at all z's such that, f of z is 0. So, yeah, so I would not, uh, yeah, it is not difficult to verify, I will just leave it as a exercise. Okay. So, you can verify that this formula will have the property that uh, for any string of uh, length l, it will be equal to uh, f of that string. Oh, and the other thing is about the size. So, now, uh, so what would be the size of this thing? So, if you look at uh, phi z, so phi z will have size l okay. and at most there can be 2 to the power l such strings okay, of length l. So, therefore, the total length will be at most l times 2 to the power l. we can take uh, yes but then it will not be a conjunctive normal form no we need it to be in conjunctive normal form but yes you can take that also in fact there are many ways to do this so this is just one way of doing it but the point is that whichever way you pick uh, you will see that always it will have, I mean it will always require exponential size. So, let us uh, uh, come back to the main claim. So, what does it mean to say that uh, sat is n p hard? It means that uh, if we take any language l in n p, uh, there should be some way of reducing l to sat. Okay. So, let us take a language l in n p. 
this means that there exist a polytime Turing machine M and a polynomial P such that for all strings x, uh, x is in L, if and only if there exist some u of length uh, p of x such that m of x comma u is equal to 1. Okay. So, what we will do is we will uh, given uh, this language L and given a string uh, any arbitrary string x, we will construct a formula uh, phi of x okay. such that if x belongs to L then phi of x will evaluate to true and otherwise it will evaluate to false. So, the idea is given x we will construct a CNF formula phi of x in polynomial time such that phi of x is satisfiable if and only if the following happens. If and only if there exist u uh, So, there is a trivial way. So, let me first uh, uh, discuss a method which, uh, which will not work okay, and then we will see how that can be modified. So, if you look at this claim uh, and if we try to replicate this claim, there is a very easy way in which uh, we can come up with a uh, formula phi of x. Okay. So, what we do is, so let us just consider the following function, uh, let me just call it potential approach. Okay. So, let me consider a function uh, f which does the following, it takes uh, strings u f basically takes a string u and it outputs whatever the value uh, m of x comma u would be. Okay. So, we can always define a Boolean function. So, given a string x, we define a function uh, f from uh, 0 comma 1 to the power p of x to 0 comma 1. So, we can define a Boolean function like this. Okay. And now, you see that this uh, f will have the property that if such an u exist, then m of x u is equal to 1 and hence f of u is equal to 1. And if such an u does not exist, then uh, uh, f of u will never be 1. Okay. So, now what we can do is uh, given such a function f, I can just replicate this claim. Okay. So, by claim 1, so let us give a number to this claim. 
So, by claim 1, there exist a CNF formula phi of f uh, such that phi of f is satisfiable and only if m of x is equal to 1. So, we have come up with a uh, CNF formula, but what is the problem with this approach? So, it will take exponential time and the reason for that is that uh, phi of f can have, so, so what, to, uh, what can be the potential size of phi of f? If you just uh, see what the claim says. So, phi of f potentially can have size how large? It will have size p of x times 2 raise to p of x, right. So, we can, uh, so we have a CNF formula, but it has a very large size and hence this approach does not work, ok. But we were we, uh, being very lazy in this approach in the sense that we never use the fact that m is a uh, polynomial time deterministic machine. Okay. So, that fact we never used and also we are not using another crucial fact that is uh, the computation of m is very local in the sense that every time. So, if you look at two steps of the Turing machine. Okay. So, going from one step to another step or going from one configuration to another configuration involves only a constant change in the configuration of machine. Okay. So, it will go maybe from one state to another state and it will probably replace uh, one bit with some other bit and so on. So, we are, we are just assuming that we have a two tape Turing machine. So, there is only a constant change that is happening. So, this these two facts somehow needs to be uh, used and uh, to come up with a CNF formula which has polynomial size. So, let us look at the correct construction now. So, we will assume uh, two things about uh, our Turing machine M and both these things can be assumed uh, without loss of generality. Assumptions on M. Okay. So, firstly we will assume that M is a two tape Turing machine in the sense that it has uh, one input tape. and one work tape. Okay. And uh, the second assumption that we will make, so if you looked at your the exercises uh, that I gave last time regarding this assumption, uh, we can assume that M is oblivious. So, M is an what is known as an oblivious Turing machine. So, what does this mean? So, this means that uh, the computation of M does not depend on the content of the input cells. 
Okay, so it only depends on uh, the size of the input and and the current step. Okay. So, if the machine is taking the ith step, no matter what uh, is present in the uh, in the tapes of that Turing machine, it would always uh, always take the same step. Okay. So, the transition function is a function of the size of the input length and uh, the position of uh, where the tape head is. Okay. It does not depend on the actual yes. Yeah. Which one? Right. So, the movement of the head is dependent only on the uh, index of that head, not on the content of that head. For different length, yes, it might be different, yeah, of course. Okay. So, we will make these two assumptions. Yeah, and the fact is that uh, even with these two assumptions, it only creates a polynomial amount of overhead. So, suppose if you have a Turing machine which uh, is general enough, okay, a corresponding Turing machine which has these properties only creates a polynomial amount of extra overhead. So, we are still fine. Okay, so, I guess I will stop here today. Uh, next class we will continue and uh, we will complete the proof of this theorem.